I don't know what Karen was, but I have to tell you, I felt so happy. She was radiating happiness. I never had a chance to learn what it takes to be a mother because of the wrong examples that I've had in my youth. I was uh, sexually assaulted by my stepfather until I was 14. He abused three young girls, also being pushed down and humiliated and threatened and hurt and hit and forced to do things you really do not want. Sometimes I recognize my fellow victims. I can just tell. And then when I see them after the show, I hug them. And I only have to say, I know. If they killed someone, we would consider them murderers. If they stole something, they're thieves. So the abuser here is a criminal. criminal. Thank you for joining me. Today I am in a town called Brückenwaterland, which is apparently means uh, pants in trousers land, which is around 40, 30, 30 minutes uh, from Amsterdam uh, in a quest to actually meet someone I've been looking forward to meet for quite some time. Uh, I've may, I may have told you many times about my dear friend Sonia Dippel, who uh, runs uh, One Billion Happy out of here in the Netherlands. And Sonia uh, texted me one day and said, um, I think you should meet Karen, host Karen on uh, on um, Slow Mo. And I was, who's Karen? Uh, <laughs> so I uh, received a link to Karen's work. I don't speak a word of Dutch other than Broekenwaterland. Uh, Lund? Broekenwaterland. Uh, the, the, the Land. 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 Broekenwaterland. And uh, so uh, basically I couldn't, un- I don't know what Karen was, but I have to tell you, I felt so happy. I have no idea what she was saying, but I was laughing. I have no idea what she was singing, but I loved it. I have no idea, uh, um, you know, who made the dresses, which turns out to be her making the dresses afterwards. But I loved the colors. I loved how she, uh, um, you know, posts on Instagram about flowers. In my personal view, she was radiating happiness radiating happiness to everything and everyone. And I have to say with my travel across the world, there is a way for people who manage to make others happy that is not in advice, not in wisdom and talk, not in lessons and teachings, but really in being, in becoming an example of how you can come across life with all of the challenges of life and end up finding a path to finding your peace. I learned afterwards that the story of Karen has not always been happy and that she had to learn on her own against all odds, how to find that happiness in her life. Uh, Karen Blumen is an actress. She's a singer. Uh, she's a, um, an Instagram sensation. Uh, she uh, is an author of two books. And I don't know what she's going to do next because in the uh, hour we spent together before we started recording, I have never been in the presence of so much energy and so much inspiration. Uh, we are at her home and in her home there is almost a million pieces of art uh, that I really was intrigued intrigued by. And then I asked, what are those, Karen? And she said they were memories. Each and every one of them was a moment that she lived and memorized in the presence of something that she kept in her life uh, to remember a moment. And I have to say, in the art of living, Uh, I have rarely encountered people who can do it as well from what I've seen so far. So uh, I'm going to invite you into the home of someone that already inspires me a lot. And we'll talk about how she started and how she ended up here and hopefully inspire you how to find your happiness regardless of what life throws your way. Karen Blumen, thank you so much for the apple pie, for the tea, for hosting us and for being so inspiring. I love to be in your presence. I'm not going to say another word. This was good. Yeah, it is from the heart. I don't know if you recognize this, but when when we were coming here, we texted a few friends that we know here in the Netherlands, whether me or Sonia, and people were very jealous. Like, you're going to be with Karen, not just (laughs) looking at Karen on a screen. And everyone was very jealous. Like, people started to throw bribes our way, saying, you know, can I be a fly on the wall, but just, you know, sit next to her and see if she's actually real. So are you actually real? (laughs) 
no, it's it's really flattering, and and I'm 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 never thinking about things like you know if people would want to meet me or want to be with me because my job is to be with people always. Mm. So I f- I feel equality more than <laughs> difference. There, there is there was that comment which is actually quite interesting as a celebrity. People called you, at least one person called you a celebrity that's like me. Yeah, because there's nothing more to it, really. What does that mean? I mean, you don't, aren't celebrities supposed to be those out there, you know, behaving yeah. weirdly? I, I, t- I teach a lot. I've been teaching ever since I was 26, 27. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and every now and then I have students and I ask them, what is your ambition? What do you want from life? Uh, what's your expectation? And when they say, I want to be famous, mm-hmm. I'm like, wow, that is not a profession. <laughs> yes. That is not a skill. Yeah. You know, being the best singer or the best actor or the best writer or the best dancer, that is a, a skill that you can aim for. Mm. But being famous, you can just drop a shit, you know, on the side, on the side of and that will make you very in the street, famous. and they'll make pictures, and you're famous. Yeah. no big deal. The, the, the person with the shit, yeah, I, yeah, yeah the, the shit producer, the shit producer. <laughs> yeah, so I, I always try to make them aware of the fact that famosity and fame and being a C lab mm-hmm. is nothing mm. compared to what real life is all about. So, so you come from a difficult background. And you spread happiness. I have to ask openly, are you happy? Now I am very happy. I feel very blessed. Mm. And I have, my husband is also my best friend. Amazing. And my, my, the person I, you know, who knows me and accepts me for what I am and for who I am. And it's, it's vice versa. Mm. So we had a discussion about being, what, what's the secret of being happily married? Mm. And, um, well, I don't know how to say that in English, actually, because in Dutch, um, it's mijn belang is jouw belang and jouw belang is mijn belang. So in English, I would translate it like, what's good for you is good for me. Mm. And what, what's good for me is good for you. Mm. And that is how you have to find the balance. Mm. How, how long have you been together? Uh, 30 years. Wow. So long. <laughs> <laughs> so 30 years. Um with now three kids? Yes. Mm-hmm. So one son, he's 39. And uh-huh. he came into my life when I was 29. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's my sister's son. Mm-hmm. And she died with two of her children. And uh, so he was all alone with a father and a stepfather to fight over him. And uh, the judge said, you take care of him. Mm. So we had to f- fight. It's, it's, of course, a very strange word to fight for a kid. But I wanted custody and I got it. And How so I raised he? him. He was six, six and a half. Mm. And so I raised him and he's now 39 and he's doing amazingly well, which which makes me very proud. Because mm-hmm. you know what it's like, you know, if, if you lose everything at that age and you don't understand why, why what happened, why, yeah. where, where did my mother go? Because it's like, you know, when you, when you die in a fire, it's everything's gone. She died in mem- a fire. Yeah. So the, with her, with two of her kids, with two of her children, a three months year old baby, a three months old baby, God, <laughs> and uh, she had a a son with autism, mm. and he was ten, and mm. he had there was no way he could escape, mm. so he was rescued, my son, mm. and at, at six and a half, and he lost everything, mm. you know, his safety, his uh, the one person that he was safe with was mm. his mom. Mm. Yeah. So and and then of course after when when everything worked out fine with him and he grew up and I was confident that he would be okay, I I found the um, he taught me how to be a mom really because I thought I would never be a mother. Why would you say that? Because I did not have the confidence. Mm. Because I thought with my childhood and my upbringing, don't even go there. I never had a chance to learn what it takes to be a mother because of the wrong examples that I've had in my youth. So I said, I'll just be a, an artiste. I'll mm-hmm. just be a performer. That's good enough. Mm-hmm. And so when he came into my life, he, f- he really actually taught me how to be a mom. Mm-hmm. And he taught me that I could be a real good mom, <laughs> that I was good at it. Yeah. And so that gave me the confidence to try and have children of your own, children to carry them and give birth to. Uh, 
mm. a couple. Yeah. And of course, I thought I, I couldn't because I, I was never pregnant ever in my life, which was a blessing in the sense that I'm, I'm a rape victim. <clears throat> so uh, I was always afraid to be pregnant and it never happened. So I actually thought that it wasn't for me. And I, that's what I told my husband. I said, forget it, baby. Mm. <laughs> it's not going to work. And then uh, after the first month we tried and I said, see, doesn't work. <laughs> and then the second month I was pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> so my whole body was apparently ready for it. Mm. And that also gave me the confidence that, you know, sometimes I make the joke, the cosmos was ready for giving me a child. And then I found out it was a girl. I, you could not have made me more happy mm -hmm. because it means that I am in alignment with my soul to give birth to a girl. And there's faith there. There's trust. Mm -hmm. There's belief that I will be able to raise them. And you raised them well. I mean, yeah, well, you know, I'm, I'm a parent like any other parent. I make mistakes. I mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, do the wrong things and they look at me like, oh, you know, when they go into their puberty, it's like, oh, oh mom, oh, <laughs> it's, it, which is so funny. And, and the good thing was when somebody told me in puberty, when your kids push you away, it means they grow stronger. Mm -hmm. They find their own strength. Yeah. So first I was insulted and I was like, what? I am wonderful. And then I realized, no, they have to push me away. Yeah. So they will find what makes them strong and wise and uh, self-depending. Yeah. So it was so cool. So every now and then I, I teased them and I said, oh my God, you're so on schedule. <laughs> and they're like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, uh, you, you know, when, when they are in their teens, I believe, you know, they're biologically designed to be independent. And by yeah. definition, if we try to squeeze them into the role of a child and we are the guardians and we are the ones responsible for everything, They're, by definition, they resist that. They don't want that in their life at all. It was amazing to find that out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the more you push them down, the more they're going to fight you. The angrier mm -hmm. you get, the more they fight you. Mm -hmm. And if you just accept that that is what they want. So we only had one rule when they grew up in the puberty. It was like, whatever happens, it's okay. Because you will make mistakes and it will happen. It's okay. There's just one rule. Don't lie. Oh, yes. Don't lie. Absolutely. So, because if you start lying, we are not able to act. Mm. If we can't help you, we can't rescue you, we can't. So, if you start lying, then things go south. Yeah. And so they did. So they came home and they're just totally drunk. I drank! And we'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. good. That's, that's your, 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 you know, motherhood test where you go like, okay, should I act really badly and then next time they would lie? Or should I yeah. embrace them and say, embrace. thank you for telling me, thank you for coming home. And that was the wrong, the wrong conclusion was, yes, I told you, <laughs> you can't punish me. <laughs> they, were, they were having fun, but they never lied. Mm. So they it's didn't amazing. become fraudulent people. Yeah. And they're still really they honest. They feel safe. Because they feel safe. Yeah. And they feel, uh, you know, you have to carry your children. Mm. And not on a platter, but you have to push them up a little bit. Make them see the high road. Mm. That's our job. I, 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 when I'm in your uh, company, your presence, I really just want to smile and laugh all the time. But I, Yeah, I really do. And I, uh, and I, but I have to say our international listeners may not know your whole story. So I, I just want to skim through it very quickly because you dropped the word, I was a rape victim. And I'm sure that some of our listeners, sadly, it is not unusual in our world. I think there are cities around the world where one of every four uh, gets, you know, that's, assaulted that's, somehow. So you're talking about the whole country. It's yeah. one out of every four. Yeah. And uh, so my story is I was uh, sexually assaulted by my stepfather from the age of seven uh, until I was 14. And uh, my my birth father, he left us when, he, when I was like three and a half. So he came into our lives really fast. And he abused me and my elder sister and the sister in between. So three young girls. And it, it lasted for too long. And it, if it would be just the sexual abuse, maybe people, you, you learn how to cope basically because you don't know when you're seven. Is that sex? You don't even understand the concept of mm. sexuality. Mm. So it just hurts. But, you know, also being pushed down and humiliated and threatened and hurt and hit and 
put away in a closet and, you know, bound with and, and forced to do things you really do not want. And I've worked all my childhood. I started working in our, we had a little shop. So I worked in the shop when I came out of school and then I had to work and then he would abuse me in between. And um, he also uh, made peeping holes in the whole house. So I would feel constantly watched and checked and controlled and ruled. And so that, that was the, the physical, the, the psychological part of being so put down by one person and living in a family in that construction that it's like a construct that is bad, not only for me, but also for my sister and my, my elder sister and my mother. So we were all victims of this harassment and of this abuse. How did your mother know about it? Well, good question. It is almost impossible. It was impossible for her not to know about my elder sister. And so my elder sister, she, my older sister, she was Annalise and she was sent away from home and she was... <coughs> No, do that, you know. <laughs> Let's do it together. <laughs> so my elder sister, she was 12 years old when she was sent away to a boarding school, like a, a girl's home. Mm. And of course, we didn't know what was happening. So she just, she was sent away. That was it. So I realized afterwards, that of course, my mother must have known. And then my stepfather promised he would never do it again, which is such a beautiful promise that he never kept. And of course, the strange thing is in a life... My, my elder sister, she she went to that girl's home and like the second night she stayed there, she was abused by one of the caretakers. So that was not a safe environment for her. So she was better off going back home. Mm. And then when my stepfather promised, I will never do it again, my mother thought she would be safe and her marriage was saved because it was her second marriage and it would be it would have been a total disaster if she would have lost her second husband as well. So it's all about guilt and shame and responsibility and loyalty and all those things together make it made all of us feel responsible for keeping it together so you don't tell you don't talk you just suffer i don't know what to say and we're saying this happens to one of every four yeah so i i when i, I wrote my book when i was 57 58 you you you're older than 57 so when i was 57 years old i started writing a book about that period in my life because i wanted to show the reader all the how the mechanism works yeah because it's total manipulation it's it's manipulation it's about power it's about all those things i just mentioned the the loyalty you feel as a child for the safety of your family family and also about you know the shame that you feel, and 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 I, I would like to communicate all the time. I, that's what I try to do with all the young people that I uh, communicate with. That the shame is not yours. Absolutely you know, not. The, the one who is, who the, the abuser is supposed to be ashamed. very ashamed. Yeah. And the guilt is not yours. He is supposed to feel very guilty because he is the guilty one. Mm. And that is the problem with. Um, a childhood like that, you feel so guilty because you didn't say no. But then, you know, when you're seven years old and you don't know what's happening, you can't say, hey, go away. You don't do that because it's your parent. It's the one that feeds you. And there's this saying, never bite the hand that feeds you. So mm. you sort of accept your fate. And that's a bad thing. And that's what no, happens I, I, to a lot of young people right now. Now. Uh, it needs to be stopped. How can it be stopped? Good question. Demo. How do we stop it? Show. First, you have to show what's really happening. You have to show the mechanisms. You have to show them that as when people have power, money, and status, a position, they are uh, capable of abusing depending people. So the professor with his student, the coach with his trainee, the father with his child. I mean, I don't know why, because I can't imagine abusing our own children. Child. It's 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 total crazy, <clears throat> but it happens. So everybody in a powerful position is, per definition, uh, a person who could or might want to do that. And you see that in every layer of our society, whether you're uh, in church 
or in government or in school or university or in the houses. It's a, it's a threat. And people don't realize that how it affects. It destroys a child. It, it, no, but not just the child, it destroys the person. It, it destroys the, the, the being able to control your life again. Mm. So after I, I wrote my book and it came out, and then lots of women wrote to me, I am 64, I've never talked about it. Now this is the first time, thanks to your book, that I, mm. I feel free to say who it was. And then they would, you know, name their uncle or their brother or their grandfather or their father. It's amazing and terrifying that people just cling on to their secret and don't tell because also they are not heard. Because if you hear somebody talk about abuse, you're like, a, oh, wow, mm -hmm. you know, I don't really. Uh, this is, Let's cha change the topic. We want to talk about happiness, but how can you be happy if you're not honest? Not to yourself, not to your spouse, not to your children, not to your family, not to your own father. You're supposed to have the right to say, you're not supposed to do that. Mm. You're, a father is supposed to make his kid happy and, and healthy protect, yeah. and protect. So what happens in your head when your parent doesn't protect you? You're lost. But not only in your childhood, also in your pu puberty, also when you're an adolescent, also when you're a grown-up person. And then, of course, if you don't tell and if you don't talk about it, it will it will bite you in the ass. I mean, it's, mm. sorry for the expression, but that's what happens. Mm. You're 35 and all of a sudden you have this burnout. You don't know what happened and you're like, I'm going crazy. Mm. And then, of course, you, you are losing it because you never talked about it. Did you, did you did you recognize? I mean, you were seven, so you didn't have a definition of sexuality. Nope. So when did you recognize that this was being done to you? At what age? That that what was being done to you is sexual abuse. Oh, you learn when you're like eleven, and your teacher at school starts talking about mm. uh, sexuality and wants to help you be aware of the fact that boys have a mm. are different than girls. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I know that. Yep. That's mm. yep. And you're like, oh my God, he's not telling anything of any importance to the whole class that we should know because he's as embarrassed as the rest of the class was. And I was the only one who knew exactly what he was talking about. So I was even more embarrassed. Mm. And the more you realize that that sexuality has nothing to do with me because it's a perversity and not intimacy, mm. you have to learn and find out what intimacy is and the perversity about, uh, you know, you have to know, learn the difference. And that is quite uh, a quest. Mm. It's a long, long road to find out what the purity of sexuality yeah. really is. Can, 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 we, can we walk that road together? So, if you, you know, I, I, I want to talk about this for the benefit of the others that have yeah, gone through too. that experience. I mean, in a, in a very uh, interesting way, I think, the extreme of sexual abuse is just part of abuse that we, you know, is is the extreme of a lot of abuse that we suffer as humans, as children. And most of the time as children, we don't realize that this should not be done to us. And you, one thing you said very, uh, I think very valid and extremely important is talk about it, is find someone and just openly say, this was happening to me. What was this? Even in your adulthood now, you know, I, I think I think lots of us have a responsibility if we're parents or if we're friends of someone or and we have any uh, suspicion of abuse, we need to take action. We can't stay quiet. We can't, you know, accept that this happens to children. So there you have <clears throat> the problem immediately is how do you prove? Because a child will never betray her parent. And a parent who does it will never admit it. Mm. So they they both will not talk about it. And of course, I've been trying to communicate as much as I can. If you don't talk, you protect the one who does it, the abuser. But if you do talk, you start protecting yourself, mm. which is like, you know, my... The, the, the words on a platter that I try to communicate all the time, you have to talk about it. Mm. But if people don't believe you, if you go to a police officer and he says, um, do you have any proof? You're like, no, it's my word against his word. And there you have it. They will tell you, 
well, if you don't have any proof, it's going to be really tough. Do you want to go that path? Do you really want to go through all the emotions and all the hardship that will bring you just trying to prove it? Mm. And then if the police officer says, I wouldn't if I was you, and then you let go and you feel totally lost. If you go to your mother and she says, really, don't be a, don't be a ridiculous, you're lying. What do you do? How can you prove it? I mean, that's, if you want to look at my phone, that's, the, that's the messages they, you know, I receive every day, you know, a grandmother that texts me, I am so afraid that my little grandson is abused by his stepfather, but I can't prove it. What do I do? And then I have to try to send them to all the different uh, 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 organizations mm. that will try and help, you know, against uh, abuse against women, abuse against children, uh, children uh, saving programs, blah, 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 blah. But you still have to prove it. It is so difficult. So, so if if we can't if we can't prevent it because it's difficult to prove it, can we at least sort of think of some kind of rehabilitation? So, you know, you're now f- fourteen when it stops. It takes you through many years more to realize. It takes you another fourteen to get over that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and what what would be the moment that you would advise people to try and reach? You know, what's the path to that? What what would be the moment where you start to be at peace, where you actually value the intimacy of sex, where you love, you know, a, 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 a man which reminds you of that other abuser man? Uh, you know, how, how do you start to go through this? Well, that's, that's a lot of questions because every, every little path that you take, you'll have to, you know, the, the main, most important word in my life was being safe. Mm -hmm. So if I meet someone and I don't feel safe, I'm out of there. And so safety is, is that's why I chose my my job. Mm -hmm. Because because I'm a performer and the the writer that I did my very, the first book about this subject was Arthur Japin. He's a very famous and internationally uh, uh, known writer. Mm -hmm. And he said, you're safe in the darkest closet of the darkest room in the darkest street. Because nobody will find you there. Mm. And you can be safe. You will be safe right in the middle of the spotlight. All the lamps are on you. Everybody can see you. Mm. So then nothing will happen to you. Mm. So apparently... I love this. Yeah, but that is the thing. I feel so safe on a stage. I I, I read once, um, (laughs) you know, the list, what are people most afraid of? And I was like intrigued. I thought, let's read that. And then it said, the first thing people are afraid of Public speaking or public appearances, yeah. yeah. Public appearances, speaking in front of an audience. And I was like, what? This is heaven. This is, (laughs) yeah, I I do that every day. This, Mm. This is not scary. This is perfect for me. But apparently... I feel safe there because it's like living in a, it's sort of, it's strange actually because it's a black box with all the light on me. And in that place, I get to be a child. I get to play. I did Aww. not play my whole childhood. But now when they say, what do you do tonight? And say, oh, I play this in this house. I go play my show there. I am, I just so, I love playing my shows. Mm. Because they let they give room to the child in me, and I can be radiant, and I can be energetic, and I can be free, and nobody tells me what to say because mm. I am the one who decides what I say. Yeah. So that has been my path. Mm. So all I'm trying to create for all these other people who are suffering from this terrible pain is showing them there is a way out. Mm. There is a way. You don't have to be in that dark closet, in the dark room, in the dark street. No. Come into the light. Come into the Come light. Come into the light. Open up. Show, show yourself. Us. Yeah. yeah. And, and try to become free. Because mm. you, you're entitled. You mm. have the right. You have the right to have intimacy. And you have the right to be a free person. And you have the right to say no. Every time somebody does something to you you don't want, you have the right to say no. doesn't mm. mean they're not going to do it because that... Sometimes doesn't work, mm. but you still have the right. Mm. And that's what I've been telling myself ever since I was 15. So, so this experience takes you to performing arts, to singing. Yeah. 
uh, but but to so many other things. There seems to be a lot of play. I mean, right behind you over there, I don't know if people will see this on camera. There is something like that looks like a toilet roll in the <laughs> middle of the living room, right? And yeah. I love it. It's so you know unexpected, but s there seems to be no rules. The, that you, you're 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 living free. Well, it's. If that makes, if that's what it does to you, then mm. it's good because mm. that's basically what it is. Mm. But freedom is never just something. I found it, and now I am free forever. Mm. If it would be like that, I would be the happiest person on earth. Of course, I still struggle. It doesn't go away. I mean, literally, uh, two weeks ago, somebody tried to grab my boob, and it was the very first time in my life that I. I was faster than he was. Mm. And I was like, oh my God. Because normally I would just freeze like when I was seven years old and it would just happen. I would not respond. I would not react. Because the, you know, we have the, our, our, the, how do, the reptile brain is what mm. they call it. Yeah. You have, you have fight three or, options. Fight or, flight or freeze. Flight, fight or freeze. And I used to freeze always. So I did that the rest of my life. I've been you know, touched in strange places and I would not do a thing. So only two weeks ago, and I'm 62 right now, right? So I'm old. And the first time in my life, I said, hey, 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 no, 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 no. Wow. We're not going to do that. I was so proud. I was like, I was, I came home and was like, you will not believe what I have done. <laughs> I said, go away. I was so proud. I was so happy. But it's really late for a first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, anyone listening, can we learn to say that a little earlier, please? <laughs> <laughs> you know? No, but I'm so proud of all those young women who stand up now and say, I had a Me Too experience and it's unacceptable. And you know what? It was him. It was her. It was him. It was her. And of course, you know, the, the problem with incest is that it's your own dad. And it's sometimes your own dad and mom. So it is so the the safety that you cling on to is the safety that is totally unsafe but what mm -hmm. do you do you depend on them so that is so difficult it's it's a whole it's it's almost a mystery how do you treat that and please could you please as a man tell me why how can a man do that what power makes him decide, well, oh, you know, let's let's fuck my kid. What? Why? When? How? Who taught them? Where did he get that? And what can we do to stop that? Because I am not the problem. I never was the problem. He was always the problem. And even sometimes the mom. So I would love to talk to men who are uh, abusers so that they can explain what the I, I don't, I never, I could, I, I actually don't even have words. I, you asked the question and I promise you, my brain started racing. Like, yes, I need to understand what goes on in the mind of an abuser of a seven-year-old. Like, what happened to your humanity? Like, yeah. Where, where, yeah. I, I, I don't understand. I honestly do not have an answer. But it would be really intriguing to find the answer to that because then you can address the problem properly. I'm, I'm working now with the government to make a program to sort of uh, address this problem and to try and find out what mechanisms, what thoughts, what... Uh, pussycat coming in. Hello, cat. Yeah, he's curious and he's probably hungry. Mm -hmm. You're working with the government. Yeah, so the government has... Uh, created a group that has to investigate in three years' time how to address the Me Too problem, how to address the abuse problem. And my goal in that group was not only to try and help the people that are suffering and, and are the victims, but also I am trying to push them forward into really uh, addressing to the problem of the abuser. Why? What? How? What were you thinking? And are people aware of how hurtful it is, not only for that moment, but for, for a lifetime? For a lifetime. It's people okay. Aren't... We have a cat on the table. Yeah, it's, it's okay. We can continue. No problem at all. <laughs> I mean, as long as we don't have the cat's butt on the on the screen. 
But, you do uh, actually. Yeah, okay, okay, right, honey, yeah. just show them your butt. <laughs> yeah, I I love that. No problem at all. Yes. <laughs> the rest of the mic. <laughs> he will do that more than once. I'm yeah, sorry. I'm very happy with this. It's the, probably uh, the first cat appearance. We've just had the first cat appearance on uh, on slow mo. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so proud. Yeah, I mean, we're supposed to be in a chill conversation. Who wants to uh, to keep the cats away? Um, okay, I I need to ask a question. I mean, in my mind, this is super criminal. Super criminal. So, so the abuser here is a criminal. They're professors, fathers, doctors, care. policemen. I don't care if they killed someone. We would consider them murderers. If they stole something, we would say they stole something. Right? They're thieves. And and they destroy lives in ways that are worse than killing someone. Now, wh- wh- how come uh, there is not a more um, a, a more serious effort around finding those criminals? I mean, it should be a proactive effort. Yeah, I can. Yeah, just yeah. <clears throat> but if you talk about you know the victims, you say one on four women is sexually assaulted, abused, or blah. It also means one. On for men is an abuser, or, or, a rapist, or, or, or a criminal, or, or the rapists or criminals are, are so raping are more than one. So, if there are million men, can you say there's one million men who are able, capable, and probably are those men who do it? If, I, I, I think the mathematics basically say we should not rest until we find out. Yeah, but what do you do with one million men who are criminal? Oh. It's it's a bit of an issue, isn't it? So are you saying that the government is not able to deal with it because of the size of the... Yeah, you know, when the, in Germany, they, they caught a whole network of pedophilia. Uh, uh, people who are sharing all the pictures. It was They were talking about 400,000 pictures and or 400,000 members, but there were a lot of people and they were sharing, you know, pictures of men having sex with babies. So you're like, what? It's a lot of men. What do you do? Do you capture them? Do you cut off their balls? I, I, I was just going to say we snip them. Absolutely. Sni- okay, we okay ladies them. and gentlemen, we have news. Yeah. Mo will have his own personal snip day. No, 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 no. no. See, see I, I know it sounds really medieval, but, but honestly. But it doesn't solve the problem because probably, apparently, <laughs> and, and this is what makes it interesting, uh, the necessity of, of, of abusing is something that is in our culture and not only ours, but worldwide. And it has to do with power. So if you don't empower women, if you don't empower children, (coughs) maybe that's part of the problem. If you look at your wife as if she's your asset and your children are also your assets and not your own flesh and blood, but more, yeah, well, you know, I got a few. Maybe it's easier to... Look at them that way. And of course, it also has to do with how the mind works. Like when they say blind rage, you know, blind rage. Mm-hmm. And they, they proved when they sliced up the, the brains <clears throat> and then they test. I'm going to take a noopy noopy now. Yes, I need to stop coughing. He they needs to s- s- slice the brain. Uh, he's going to take some heroin now so that he stop <laughs> coughing. Maybe we should cut this. <coughs> Maybe you should keep it. <laughs> <laughs> you five, five shots lot. <laughs> yes, people. I'm. I'm. Yeah, so, so for our listeners, I've been having a tiny bit of a cold, and I, um, I have to take some something for my throat. He's taking drugs. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's the name throat. for it. Drugs. Yeah, yeah, thro- it is actually. Yeah. It is a drug. Yeah. Which is funny. Yeah, I'm. I'm so. It's funny how you can bring laughter to a topic like this. But so, so, so I, I, I actually want you know, to move the, to the, the positive side. The Buddhist side. leader, he, mm-hmm. uh, he said, you know, laughing opens up your soul, which makes it easier to reach you. Mm-hmm. Which is it does. A, it does. It does. It does. But I, so, 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 you know, it, it seems to me, and you're not my first guest to talk about the topic, and it is by far the topic that enrages me most. I'm normally very calm, uh, normally accepting of life's ups and downs. You know, um, I I have gone through enough challenges in my life to understand that life can be tough. But this to me, I think is the worst crime humanity has ever committed uh, because it doesn't, when you, when you, when you steal from someone, at least they have a possibility of 
regenerating what was stolen, yeah. you know, maybe recovering it at a point in time. This reality of being abused by someone who is supposed to protect you is a lifetime of trauma, a lifetime of pain. And, and uh, you know, maybe, maybe you and I are not the ones responsible for or capable of preventing it, but what would your advice be if one of our listeners knows in her heart or his heart, by the way. Yeah, um, yeah it happens to uh, a lot of men too. Yeah, if, boys. If, if, if they know in their heart they've been abused, what was your path to become the beautiful, cheerful, wonderful mother, <laughs> wonderful uh, uh, human that you are? Well, actually, I just decided not to lie. Mm. I refused to not talk about it. <clears throat> so every time... You know, like my first day uh, at, at the, the the School of Theatrical Arts, and we had to talk about what's your story, what's your story, what's your story, and I thought, yeah, I'm no. not gonna lie one minute. No. So your first answer? <laughs> yeah. I just told him. Mm. I come from an abusive childhood. I've been raped by my stepfather, and it wasn't once, it wasn't twice. No, it was more than a thousand times. And that is my story. And of course, when I was young, I got really cold and distant. And, you know, then you have to like, you layer your protection walls to, to not cry, to not crash, to not fall into desperation. And, but the, you know, the, the older I got, the freer I felt to just be honest about it. Because mm. why lie? It's not my disgrace. Yeah. Why, why, yeah. It's his. Mm. And of course, I had to learn to let go because I didn't want to become. How do you do that? I mean, to find, did you ever find forgiveness? For him? Mm -hmm. It's a good question because uh, I realized that, you know, when you look at what, what overcomes people, we are actually all victims. His father was exactly like him. His brothers did exactly the same thing. So they were all raised in this toxic environment of abuse. So he didn't know better. He should have known. And of course, he was not clever enough to stop it. You know, he said, he told the, the judge who said, you're guilty. And do you want to say anything? And then he said, um, well, judge, it's like smoking a cigarette. Once you start, you can't stop. Oh my God. I know. And it made me realize, if that is what you think it is, you are so off. You are so off what it really is, and how hurtful. So because of what he said, I never felt ashamed because it's his sociopathic Defect. mind yeah. that really believes that that's the thing. And so forgiveness is, is it, you know, I can't live with rage and hate and grudge. And, you know, the I dreamt a lot about, you know, killing and stabbing car tires and... but. Revenge. All it did, it ruined me because mm. it made me feel bad every time. And it, it ruined my, uh, my, my, my good, my, my sleep, you know, I, so I had to deal with that first. You have to let go of the, the revenge part and the, and the anger part, because otherwise you cannot be happy. You have to learn to love yourself first mm. before you can share your love. But, but a lot of people would say, yeah, what well, sounds wonderful. How do I do that? How, how, how do I let go of a thousand times of pain? By accepting that it's there and accepting that you are not that person and that what happened to you has nothing to do with intimacy. It is perversity. So, and I am not a perverse person. I, some, some people even say, can you have sex after this? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> because it has nothing to do with what he did. My sexual experience is, is about intimacy mm. and about pure love and trust and being safe mm. with the man I love. Mm. Nothing to do with what he did. Nothing. So it's really, it's two different worlds. And you have to sort of let go of the, of the bad uh, version. Do, do you but it takes, it takes a long time, I know. And it takes a very good psycho psychotherapist also. So therapy is, is, is a very big advice for sure. Yeah, so yeah of course. You, you need a partner to talk about all these things. And then, and then somebody tries to explain to you how it works, how your mechanisms sometimes, you know, 
fuck your brains a little mm-hmm. bit. And then they say, uh-uh, uh-uh, no, please go back. Yeah. You know, I, I used to work so hard because the only place I felt safe was on stage. So mm-hmm. what do you do? You're on stage all, all the time. time. I work so hard. And because I was raised with working hard, that is what I knew best. So mm-hmm. you feel also safe. I was safe at school because he couldn't hurt me. So I loved going to school. I loved learning. I loved teaching myself. So I'm very disciplined and I'm a hard worker. But there comes that moment in your life that that even ruins you mm-hmm. because 100% is never enough. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> I think I was like 33 um, and I went to my psychotherapist. I, I was really close to a burnout. And then he said, you're still trying to prove your birth father that you're okay. Mm. But you are okay already. If he would be alive, he would have told you, I am so proud of you. Stop ruining yeah. your body. Stop ruining your health. Be happy with what you have. And that was the wisest thing someone ever said to me. Because I realized I'm still pleasing my old man, (laughs) my dad, who left us Mm -hmm. because I was the third child. So I was, I always thought I'm not good enough. You're the reason. He saw me and it was like, oh, fuck, another, (laughs) another, that's literally what he said. Oh, Mm. another girl. Because he wanted a boy so bad. So he tried his luck elsewhere. It was my fault. Wow. So only if you let go of that thought. And then I realized, oh yeah, I have to, I have to live mm. and, and feel the value of being alive, being loved, having children, and enjoying nature and mountains and water, and not by owning them, but just enjoying them. Mm. So I don't care so much about, you know, stuff. Yeah. It's not important. It's about enjoying what is. Yeah. And not complaining about what you don't have. I think that's that's probably why this place is so special because it's not stuff. No, no, it's, it's totally. It's not valuable. Yeah, it's life. It's, it's life. Yeah. Every time I look at that picture, it's like, oh my god, we went to Kyoto in Japan and we were walking in those gardens and we saw five hundred year old culture, how they made it, and it's still, you know, I'm there, mm. which is great. Yeah. It's it's so beautiful. I I th- I have to say, from stalking you for a while, you really are good at living, at at turning life not into targets, but into moments. I mean, you achieve and you succeed and you, and so on. But there is that little, there's that very interesting flavor to you. You know, teaching us about flowers and roses, right? Yeah. Uh, because this is not about getting to the flower. It's a, you know, it's not about holding the flower. It's about the whole idea of caring for the flower. But you know, a plant, it's beautiful in the summer and then it sort of like half dies. And in the winter, it's just a very sad. (laughs) (laughs) Sometimes people just take it out and throw it away. But I'm like, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. No, I'll I'll try to cherish it also in winter. Mm -hmm. And then in this, you know, in the spring, it becomes back and has a new life. Mm -hmm. So And you don't have to buy new plants. You can just take care of the plants. Like you take care of yourself. Like I have to take care of myself and of course my children and of course my husband and of course the people I work with. And I try to be, my my work is about communication, Mm. about looking people in the eye. I sometimes, I'm I'm on a stage and I see people and there's one guy like this. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm like, oh. Mm -hmm. Must be tired. But sometimes... I, I have colleagues and then they say, I'm so insulted. Somebody was sleeping. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> let him sleep. He's okay. It's fine. He felt safe. He felt safe, <laughs> yeah. And sometimes it's some, some people find it really hard to look you in the eyes. Mm-hmm. And then I know she has a problem. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I recognize my fellow victims mm-hmm. because they... I can, I, can just, I can just tell. Yeah. And then when I see them after the show, I hug them. Mm. And I only have to say, I know. Do you really? I know. Do you yeah. say that? Of course I do. Oh my God. And I try to give my energy so that they, f- I lift them up. Because if you, every person wants to be seen. Seen and safe. Seen and safe. Which is so different from being watched like what my stepfather did, you know, mm. through peeping holes. I don't want to be watched. <coughs> I want to be seen. And mm. I want, I want to show people, but you know, 
instead of, uh, that's why I hate, you know, the paparazzi and, you know, when you feel caught and, and sneaked it, upon. It's because of the dresses, Karen. Yeah. Everyone wants a picture of those. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone Basically. does. Basically, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I will have to sort of, uh, you know, ask for my own selfie of that. I mean, it's really. I'll just put you in my uh, <laughs> where I keep all my theatrical dresses. Oh I'll just my leave you there. god! I will dress you up like the Queen of Sheba. <laughs> you would dress me up like oh, the yeah. Queen of Sheba. I think I that would picture. go viral. <laughs> <laughs> it would, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. No, um, no but. The thought about the dresses, you know, the, the theatrical dresses is if you go to a show. You make them I yourself, to, right? No, no, the, this mm. I make myself. Uh-huh. So all the, the, the crochet mm. and all the theatrical dresses. How, how long I, does it take you to make this? You really want to know? I do, I do, I do. Uh, you know, it's about like three weeks to a month. That's wonderful. And it's four hours of crocheting every day. Every just day. That's continuare, meditation. continuare, continuare. Uh-huh. Just go, 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 go. Mm. But I mean, that car... I'm always on my way to a theater mm. somewhere in the country. And of course, it's usually a, like a, a more than a half hour, two hour drive to and fro. So that's four hours of pure crochet excitement. <laughs> yes. But of course, the theatrical dresses are made by my designer and, and costume designer. And that's he's, his name is Jan Arendse. Mm. And he's been doing that for 33 years also. Mm. I'm quite loyal. Uh-huh. I think that's a wonderful thing. It's safe. Also, it's safe, but also it means I respect what he does. Mm. And I think of stuff and I'm like, oh, I want to dress and I want to blah, blah, blah. And he says, oh, yeah, that's okay. I'll think about it. Mm. And then he, he makes a drawing of what he thinks it should be. And it's always better. Mm. It's perfect. Mm. So he is better than me in making the dresses and making, making them up. Mm. And drawing is also his... <laughs> yeah, he's yeah. better at that. Yeah, I, I think that's at least give him something to be give any of us something to be good at. I mean, yeah. en- enough. But, you're but doing respect enough. that. Don't be yeah. jealous. Yeah. I mean, I, I had that for just a little second, like mm-hmm. the first year. Mm-hmm. I was like, hmm, <laughs> <laughs> I can do better than this. <laughs> Damn, he's mm-hmm. good. Mm-hmm. But then respect what he does. Mm-hmm. Believe and 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 acknowledge his. Uh, that's, that's also with Monix. You know, we work together. We write together. He he's the director of the show. He makes he writes some of the the best music for the show. The original songs are of his hand. Mm. So we have to respect that we know what we're talking about. If he's correcting me as a director for the show, and he, he can have you know a notebook. Uh, don't do that ever again. Uh, that line was wrong. That was off. You're not in. You know, he, he does that every night mm-hmm. when we make a show. Mm-hmm. If I don't respect him, then it's not going to work. Mm-hmm. So I have to believe him and that his his goal is to make the best show we can at that point in time. Mm-hmm. And so I just, I just, I follow. Mm-hmm. So you have to let that ego go. Oh, that's one more. That, that's like four. I like it, an ego. <laughs> that's like four episodes that we will need. Yeah, well, uh, ego. <laughs> Podcast number 15. The ego. The ego. Do you have one? <laughs> I, everyone does. Everyone has one. Everyone yeah. has one. I mean, I, I always say there is no way you can kill your ego. You just have to own it rather than let it own you. I think that's the whole idea. So, so if, if, if oh, yeah. you, you know, I, I'm, I'm now in my ego of being a podcast host, which means I will listen. I will ask interesting questions. I will not interrupt. I will do that. It's a, it's a persona. It's a, right? Yeah. If, if, you know, when, when you and I were standing before the recording, I was the ego of the fan. I was like, <laughs> you know, I'm the fanboy. I love everything that you do. And there is nothing wrong with being in a certain role uh, as long as the, you don't let that role own you, right? You don't, you don't let it um, be upset you if people go like no you're not really a fanboy no i am by the way so yes so but i find it very interesting to have those discussions like with my pupils Mm. you know they they come to me for a a singing lesson Mm -hmm. and a performance lesson yes and then sometimes they will have some other people say but you're never really you you have to be yourself Mm. and we can talk about that like for a long time the concept of self i love that that is such an interesting discussion. Yeah. I actually think you're very you, but that your you is very unlike no, but, the use of us. 
No, but the self is always the self because mm. it's just fragments of different me's, but it's all me. Mm. Like I can be happy, I can be not happy, I can be grouchy, and I can be naughty, and I mm. can be sexy, and I ugh. the self is always the one thing. Mm. So when people all of those together, if t- people try to put you down mm. by saying, "Well, you were not really yourself, were you?" Mm. It's like. Please ex- it was one tell. of me. Yeah, it's it's always me. Mm. You are always you. Mm. The self is you. Mm. I love this so much. Actually, I think it requires a bit of awareness, though, to to say yeah that this part is me, but that part isn't. That yeah, it's know? it's ridiculous. Uh, yeah. You can't say that. But but there are there are parts that we pretend to be. It's not us. Yeah, but even that is you. Do you think so? Of course, I can be a total n- nitwit, mm-hmm. and I can do really <laughs> strange stuff, but it's still me. Mm-hmm. It's just a fragment of of me that I show. That's what I give. Like but, in but a, I, I, so, I, I in my corporate work in my life uh, in the corporate world, uh, you know, people will show up and use words like synergy and uh, you know yeah. chasm and uh, you know three letter acronyms and appear you know in a certain way with a certain dress with a certain uh, tie or or shirt and you know it's not them. I mean, like you're my friend. We were raised together. What happened to you? But they assume that persona, they assume that role, and it's not them at all. You know that to be true, and many of them are yeah, name it's dropping. Still and it's them. Not, yeah, it is. Of course, they chose to be that that character. But of course, the other, the whole self is in there. They just put the other one down. Uh-huh. And the danger is if you put that other self or the you know the other parts of yourself, if you start suppressing, mm. you know. Your, your ability to be gay and witty and funny and free mm-hmm. and, you know, naughty. And if you if you suppress, they will fight back. <laughs> and yeah. They will get you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like if, if you're if you're always touched, oh, I'm so giddy. I'm so giddy. And you never show your emotions. Your emotion or sadness. What yeah. happens is when they come out, they are like a volcano. They mm. just burst out mm. because it's always there. Mm. Because... Life, I remember I went to university for one year and I studied the English language. Mm-hmm. And Very course, well, I may say. Oh, thank you, darling. Oh, thank you so much. I had to speak the Queen's English only. Oh, oh yes. keep going. Oh, you do, do like that, don't you then, darling? Well, actually, that was, it was terrible because they really wanted me only to speak the Queen's English. Mm-hmm. And I would do a lot of Courtney accent, you know what I mean? I'll be too a lot of me for foot and ever. And then I said, oh, foot and ill, you know what that? And then the professor would say, I am so sorry, only the Queen's English, please. Okay. So, but, but when I, they also had uh, a, a two hours of philosophy. Mm. And of course, I come from, you know, my background did not really give me any philosophy at all. <laughs> so then I heard about Plato and about Jung and, you know, all those sort of, all those philosophers that were like, oh my God, this is so, the only thing I found interesting about that, you know, being on that university was the philosophy class. Mm. And the first thing I heard was there's balance. There is black and there is white. And if you put the white down, it doesn't mean that the black goes up. Mm. It goes down. It, mm. it, it, it's, it will always look for balance, always. Mm. Mm. So black does not exist without the white. Mm-hmm. And sad doesn't exist without the giddy. Mm. And happiness doesn't exist without unhappiness. Mm. So if you try to suppress one of, you know, to, try to, to, to dis, make a disbalance, it will bite you in the butt. <laughs> I won't say ass again. I did say is, ass again. Is that the Queen's English? Oh, I do know, darling, but but is probably better. Yes, actually. <laughs> I am so sorry. Yeah, but it's intriguing. Mm-hmm. I, so if if black and white are yeah, you need- equally important, it also means that all the greys in between are equally important. Mm. Because that's what makes the scale of all the colors. Mm. If you leave one out, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. You just left one out. Mm. And it will cry out for attention. So being egotistic also means that altruistic is is his partner. Altruism, egoism, mm-hmm. they're partners. So it's about balance, trust and distrust, safety and unsafety. It's all balance. And, and balance is not all of them at the same time, but all of them when they are about to rise. So yeah, you so let every part of you... Like you show this part more and then the other day that... I that's, feel sometimes that, giddy that and is, sometimes sad. Yeah, that so. is who you are, actually. So every one of those shows up and you can yeah. see it. And then they say, oh, you're a bit crazy. Oh, yeah. I just try to not suppress anything. 
Mm. So when I make a show, I try to use that to make my characters in my theater shows. Mm. So I also, do you know the, the principle of the elements? Fire, water, yeah. earth, and air. And wind, yeah. Wind or mm. air. It's so important to give every element mm -hmm. a place in a show. So mm. some people will connect with the air part, some with the fire part, some with the earth part, some with the emotion, the water part. Mm. It's so important because that's what we are. That's mm. what we uh, consist of. Is that what you get yeah, that's say, what right? we're made of, yeah. Yeah, that's what we're made of. Mm. So it's really important to do that. So you, everybody will feel at home when they go to my show because they will sometimes not relate to that one, but I did relate to that one. Interesting. I have I have to say I'm I'm going on retreat in a bit, and I'll have to contemplate that very very deeply. That you know, for most of us, for me, for you know, definitely in the public eye, I show more parts of me than others. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm quite silly. If you really, really, I mean, I I've been called his silliness before. Yeah. So <laughs> good for you. Yeah, the royal silliness. Yes. So, but but that doesn't show in public, and maybe it should. Right? And maybe it should. Yeah, why not? I mean, it shows in private, but maybe maybe that should no, be. But you don't have to. It's mm. not like a rule. But if I feel like it. If you feel like you're free. Mm. I mean, that's that's the good thing about life. You can mm. choose. Mm. Nobody's holding you back. Nobody's mm. telling you, oh, you can do that. You mm. can. Do anything like you want. Like the best businessmen I know are totally relaxed. I'm not bothered with yeah. the jackets and the straight, the, the, yeah. the rules and, the, and all those words totally. you just said that I yeah. do not know. Yeah. They are totally relaxed. I know this one guy, he runs, he runs a, a really big company. He knew everyone by name. And not because he had to, but because he mm -hmm. wanted yeah, to. Yeah, absolutely. And he would look people in the eyes and say, I'm so sorry, I have to do this and I have to ask you to do that. Can we, mm. or is there a problem? Can I help you? Can you help me? Yeah, can we get it done somehow? Can we get it done? Because that is the thing. We have team. to get it yeah. as a team. Yeah. That's what I do when I make shows. We are yeah. a team. It's yeah. not about, I am the princess. Yeah. And then the rest is just, yeah, that's, you know, staff. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> no. <laughs> if I yeah. make a show and I do a song and one of my, uh, my, my, my musicians come to me and say, oh my God, I hate that song. It is so awful. I'll take it out. Will you? Of course. I don't want somebody on stage playing a song. <laughs> it's terrible. Yeah. I want them to feel happy. Mm. I want them to uh, to shine. Mm. It, it has to be their moment as well as my moment. That's so interesting. Why should... There are you like a thousand it. songs, so if, let's... If you like it and you're the star, like, you know... I don't want to be the star. A star is nothing. Again, famosity, being famous, it's nothing. It is... It is and it's not a, a requirement. It's, it's all about making the best work for the audience mm -hmm. and for my staff. Yeah. I don't bake a cake every, you know, every week for me. I bake it for them. Mm. And when they're like, oh yeah, baby, I <laughs> love come this apple cake. pie. <laughs> I'm happy. Yeah. I made them happy. Mm. Okay, I'm going to steal one more tip from you. If everything you know about happiness, <laughs> yeah. everything you know, what would be your top tip? You ask me now? <laughs> <laughs> Take your time. The real thing about being happy is that you cherish what is. Mm. And that you don't go after everything you don't have. And that you're not in the, I call it the waiting room. Mm -hmm. That you don't tell yourself, no, but if the, if I have the house, I will be happy. If I have the right person to marry, I am happy. The, the, the waiting room is not what makes you happy. Mm. So don't be in the waiting room. Accept what is. And when you accept what is, that also includes what has been. And what has been. Mm. Yeah. Harsh as it may have been. Learn from it. Be a wise person. Don't judge. Share. Don't be selfish. Share. Tell people that you accept them as they are. And, and the principle is color, belief, skin, whether you're, I mean, L, B, Q, T, E, A, P, whatever words there are, it's okay. Mm. Just be good. It's not that difficult to just be good. I love you very, very much. I think you're an amazing, amazing human being. I'm so grateful that you... I, I, I expected, honestly, that we will just laugh the whole podcast. <laughs> I really did. I mean... Uh, I'll take off my clothes and God, you'll... <laughs> see? 
That makes him laugh. <laughs> no. Usually um, many people panic. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I laugh. Uh, and I'm so grateful that you shared so openly. I think it's, uh, it's important that, that we keep sharing about this, that we keep changing. In these times when people are filled with fear and uncertainty and the craziness in the world, and the fear of being becoming sick or losing your stuff. And that's what I, you know, the last two years, what worried me most was the fear I saw mm. that people were like, ooh, there's mm. another person. Mm. And and the polarization and, yeah. and putting people away because they think differently. Mm. Whenever was a thought a danger to mm. you, mm. you're supposed to come together, embrace, listen talk, speak, whether it's about politics or about, you know, the pharmaceutical industry or about uh, your personal life or what happened to you when you were young, whether you're a victim or a, or a, a, a talk, be together. Yeah. Open up and talk. Yeah. Yes, boss. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Karen, thank you. Thank you. And for I'll all say of you. thank you now for the rest of the hour. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for having us here. Thank you for the beautiful, beautiful conversation. I will actually have to summarize quite a few things that I learned today. Um, there is a beauty to being able to live, to really embrace not every moment, every memory, uh, to not care about things, but to embrace who you are. To, I think uh, I will you know, ponder this for a very long time, that there are so many sides to each of us that every one of them is you and that every one of them should be let out to play because if they don't play, they'll come out and bite you at a point in time. I think the idea of living openly to be able to share and talk and connect and respect others is really, really interesting in terms of allowing you to really accept Everyone around you, just like you accept what is. I, uh, one of my favorite books of all time is Loving What Is uh, by Ryan Katie. And I definitely think that one of the secrets to happiness, probably one of the top secrets to happiness is to really embrace what is. Even what has been, even if what has been has actually been rough, difficult, harsh. I will, however, on a serious note say, if you have been a victim please speak up. Please don't keep it inside you. Please understand, like Karen said, you are not the bad person. You should not have shame. You should not be guilty. It's the perpetrator that should. You're a wonderful human being. And sharing is really what gets, the, what gets you moving uh, forward in life. Find a therapist, Karen said. Uh, if you can't share with a friend, or if you do even, still find a therapist to help you organize that experience and um, understand that there is no point in holding on to a grudge because, as I always say, the, the perpetrator is not going to suffer from your pain. So maybe what you need to do is to forgive or not move on for yourself because what you need is to be free. Now, I'm going to say a very important statement. If you are listening to us and you've continued with us until now and you're hurting someone, please stop. I think you understand uh, how you were hurt if you were in their position and how everyone I've hosted here that spoke about being abused has been hurt. And I honestly don't know how we can stop this other than asking you to consider not doing to anyone what you don't want done to yourself. And that's it. I am very, very grateful that you give me the opportunity to meet such amazing human beings, to have such amazing experiences, to have my heart open because you keep listening to slow-mo. And I love you all for listening and I will see you next time.